أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم I seek refuge in God from Satan the accursed in the name of God the most compassionate the most merciful I send my salutations to Prophet Muhammad and his pure household In just a few days, the month of Ramadan will begin. And it will end just like the previous years. What is the responsibility of each of us in the month of Ramadan regarding ourselves, regarding others? And our responsibilities regarding God Almighty, regarding Islam, regarding the Prophet of Islam, and regarding the pure household, the Ahlul Bayt, regarding our families. We have to answer for all of our responsibilities in the afterlife. Let's make a resolution today. We should ask God Almighty through the prayers. These prayers are treasures. We should read these prayers word by word and contemplate on them. We should see if we are complying by those prayers. If that's the case, we should ask Almighty God to help us continue. And if not, we should ask Almighty God and pray to the Holy Ahlul Bayt to intercede us and help us be successful, otherwise it won't be possible. There is a prayer narrated by Imam Jawad. It is about the first night of Ramadan. Just try to read this prayer before the arrival of Ramadan. All believers, men and women, try to read it at once. Everyone, the students, business people, lay people, read this prayer for once before the arrival of Ramadan. It is a recommended act to read this prayer with attention. Here, I would explain one sentence from this prayer. Imam Jawad invokes to Almighty God in this prayer guide us to development and make us successful. What does Wahdina mean? What does Rashad stand for? What is Wafiqna? What about Sadat? Those 
those scholars and linguists, the academics, they can search for the meanings of these four words. I don't want to just go into details. The scholars can delve into the meanings of this prayer. Generally speaking, we should know that guidance is from Almighty God. Rashad or development is only from God Almighty the same way. It can be development in scientific or religious arenas. Imagine two business people who have started exactly with the same budget. One of them develops, makes develop, developments, and the other one just fails in economic matters. Let's say somebody studies for almost 50 years, but he doesn't make any progress. On the first night of Ramadan, Imam Jawad was speaking these words to the Almighty God. Oh God, guide us to development. Perfect our knowledge, wisdom, and intellect in all matters, familial or social. For those rulers, perfect their wisdom in running the affairs of the public. So long as any person is alive, should ask for these great prayers. But Ramadan is the spring of prayers. It is the best time and opportunity to ask for these requests. In Ramadan, every action, every worshipping act is rewarded 70 times. If you do a good religious act in Ramadan, you'll be rewarded multifold. If you read one verse during the month of Ramadan, you'll be rewarded for rewarding for reciting a whole Quran. If you just say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim on the first night of Ramadan, it equals but with reading a whole Quran in other months. Many people succeeded in the month of Ramadan and many others didn't. It is only relying on one's firm resolution. It needs people to be hardworking and not give up in the face of hardships. One should even use scholars to consult them in this matter. 
When people want to go on a Hajj pilgrimage or going to start a business, they just ask for the consultation of the experts. We do research and ask for consultation in everything we do. In this case, we should also do the same. We should survey the Holy Quran and read the narrations or ask from the scholars, ask them to help us. We have to ask for help from the trustworthy scholars. Imam Qasim had many instructions for the Shia while he was in prison. As from the scholars that are trustworthy and honest. One of the companions asked Imam Sadiq, what is the difference between the Muslims, the believers, and the Jews? We all follow the orders of our scholars. Why is it bad for them and good for us? What is the distinction? This narration is found in the book of Rasail by Sheikh Ansari. The Imam answered that the difference is that the Jews saw that they can buy their scholars, they can pay their scholars to give them the same, the verdicts they like. But about the Shia, they refer their questions to the holy infallibles. Their leaders were pious and infallible people. This is the distinction between the Jews and the Shia Muslims. Now, the Imams continued, if a scholar and the Shia Muslims behaved like the scholars of Jewish Judaism, if the Shia scholar lied, was bribed, Uh, I met someone in Iraq. He said, he used to say that everything is halal in your hand. If you follow a scholar like this one, you are no different from the Jews. The only criterion, the only criteria are the Holy Quran, the Holy Prophet, and the Ahlul Bayt. We have to prepare for this month. It might not be easy, but the reward is being the companions of the Holy Infallibles in the afterlife. Certainly the price is not cheap. Everyone should make the resolution to be better, no matter how good they are now.
از اصحاب امام صادق علیه السلام و وکیل امام صادق A scholar who was a representative of Imam Sadiq. He was also the representative of Imam Qazim. He was Ali ibn Abi Hamza Bataini. When he died, on the first night of his grave, Imam Riza, peace be upon him, said that this companion of the infallible, the two infallible Imams, was hit with a with a rod of fire that he is burning until the day of judgment. He is still burning at the moment. Everyone should work hard. You should always try to be better, to excel in every possible way. One of the famous Shia scholars, I had met him, he was a great Islamic jurist. He was said that this scholar, when he was a young student, he used to go to the cemetery. He had a grave for himself. He had prepared a grave for himself in the cemetery. He just wore a shroud. And then he went to lie down into the grave. He started crying. He just reminded himself that one day he will end up in the grave. If one is not dying in a good shape, he will ask God to give him a second chance to live once again in the life to compensate for his misdeeds. But this scholar thought to himself, what if a God really brings me, brings me back to life? This is scholar, though he was an old man after years when he was old, he never ordered his family members, even his family members, to do him a favor. It is possible to become like this. It is the only chance we are given to live in this life. We know, we all know people who were here with us in the previous Ramadan, but are not still, but are not among us in this Ramadan. This will happen to every one of us. And we will have to regret to have lost the Ramadans that we lived. God has given everybody the intellect, aql. Everybody has some beliefs according to his intellect. And God would requi re require every servant, every person to perform actions based on in intellect. God does not burden people more than their capacity. God has given everyone the intellect. In contrast, we have the commanding soul in every one of us, inside every one of us. The commanding soul 
is very powerful. The Quran mentions how powerful the commanding soul is. Many people have gone straight forward to hell. They were people like us. One of the great scholars used to say, Shemr and Habib ibn Mazahar were friends for, a long year, for many long years, but one of them ended up in hell and the other one ended up in paradise. They both had the commanding soul. They both had the intellect. But Habib chose to follow his intellect and Shem chose to follow his commanding soul. People are free to choose between guidance and misguidance. We should read the biography of good scholars. I don't mean that there are evil scholars, but there were examples in history, like Ali ibn Abi Hamza Bataini. Shalmagani was a great scholar that people in, in the city, in his city, thought him to be a, a special deputy of Imam Mahdi. That's what he thought himself. But when the Imam chose Hussein ibn Ruh as his deputy, Shalmagani, became upset. Shalmagani was, was much more famous and popular among people. But Hussein ibn Ruh was chosen as the deputy of Imam, of, of Imam Mahdi. He started speaking improper things about Imam Mahdi. People came to Hussein ibn Ruh, the delegate of Imam Mahdi. People told Hussein ibn Ruh that we have a lot of books, narrations, books of narration, that have been written by Shalmagani. There were books of religion, narrations about jurisdiction and beliefs. What happened to him? It was his commanding soul that made him like this. And we all have the same commanding soul inside of us. There was a very famous scholar among the Shia at that time. His name was Nobacht. You can find this story in the book Bihar al Anwar. The dear youth, everywhere they are, should read these stories. Nobacht was a very popular scholar. He was even more popular than Hussein ibn Ruh. The second deputy of Imam Zaman was sick. Hussein ibn Ruh and Nobacht, they both had come to visit the second deputy of Imam Mahdi. Nobacht, since he was a popular scholar, sat next to the second deputy. Hussein ibn Ruh was not a very popular scholar, he was a typical scholar. So he was sitting, 
next to the feet of that of the second deputy. The deputy received a letter from Imam Mahdi. He was informed that he is going to die, and he was ordered to announce to the Shia that the next deputy will be Hussein and Nehru, who is sitting just right next to his feet. Nobach was sitting right next to him. He was a very famous and popular scholar. When he read the letter, when the second deputy read the letter of Imam Mahdi, Imagine, Nubat was a very famous scholar, but Hussein ibn Ruh was a very typical scholar. Nubat stood up and changed places with Hussein ibn Ruh as a sign of respect. He was submissive to the orders of the God's final proof to mankind. People asked Nubakht, why, what do you think, why Imam Mahdi did not choose you and chose Hussein ibn Ruh instead? He remembered the story of Shalmaghani, he just insulted Imam Mahdi. Nubakh said that it is only what Imam Mahdi can tell. But he then went on, if I know that, if Hussein ibn Ru is, if Hussein ibn Ru is somewhere and Imam Mahdi is hiding underneath his robe, if the enemies try to kill the Imam, he would sacrifice his life for Imam Mahdi and would not allow the enemies to hurt Imam Mahdi. But actually I think about myself that I cannot do this. This is what he thought, of course. Imam Mahdi may have other reasons. You should start from tonight. Well, actually, the month of Ramadan is the greatest opportunity for one to start these things. I have met a lot of people who had the stories from Sayyid Abul Hassan Isfahani. People from Iran and Iraq. My brother used to tell me to narrate this story from Sayyid Abul Hassan Isfani, that this scholar constructed hundreds of houses for the poor. He used to help the poor people to buy houses. I myself met one of those poor people who bought a house by the help of this great scholar. Mm -hmm. 
That poor person came to me and told me that I was given a lot of money by this scholar. And there are many other examples, hundreds of such like examples. But Said Abul Hassan Isfahani, this scholar, he lived in a rental place all his life. He did never buy a house for himself. He was told that you're buying houses for everybody. But then he said that I did not buy houses for everybody. There are still people who don't have a house. There are traditions that Imam Ali said that God has taken an oath from the just leaders to lead a life like the poorest people in their countries so that the poverty do not provoke people. If that scholar said Abul Hassan is funny, he had a lot of money. The reason he was remaining, he was living in a rental place, was because there were still people who had not the power to buy a house. And so poverty could not provoke those poor people because they knew that their leader is still living in a rental place. Uh, people s said to uh, this scholar that Imam Ali even himself did not live in a rental place. Imam Hassan also did have a house of his own. The same is true about Imam Hussein. Imam Ali used to live in his own house. He didn't have a rental place. So why don't you buy a house of your own, like those great infallible Imams? But see the answer. Of course, it's okay for scholars to have a house of their own because they have families and their families should live at ease. But this scholar that is the leader of the entire Muslim world is a different story. This scholar was told that Imam Ali used to live in his own house. But this scholar answered, Do you know any person who lived in a rental place at the time of Imam Ali? People, old people had their houses, had houses of their own during the reign of Imam Ali. Imam Ali never sold an iota of land to anybody. People had to, had the free hand to construct a land and live in those lands. The only owners of a land is Almighty God and the people who cultivate a land or construct a house in a land. He said that during the time of Imam Ali, Nobody had to live in a rental place. Only passengers had to live in a rental place. When they were traveling to different areas, when they needed to stay for the night in a city, they had to rent a place. But people during the reign of Imam Ali didn't have to live in a rental place because they afforded to buy a house. These are lessons that should be learned. This is the requirement of an Islamic leader. The same story is right, true about Said Muhammad Taqishi Razi. He led a great uprising against the Great Britain. They led a successful campaign against the colonizers in Iraq. But this is scholar, but this is scholar lived in a rental place all his life. His family told him that if you 
pass away, how can we continue to live in a rental place after you? Because we have no money. These lessons should truly be learned. Mirza Muhammad Taghi smiled and answered, I have lived among people in a way that if I pass away, they will take care of you. They will allow you to live in a house. Self-development is the primary task of everybody in Ramadan. Everyone should start doing this, proportionate to their intellect. We should not allow the commanding soul to overshadow our intellect. Sadat means the right work. Rashad means the development. Part of it is God-given and some part of it is obtained through hard work. Sadat means to do good. How should one handle his family in a way that God Almighty is uh, pleased with him? How should the business people run a business the way that God Almighty is pleased with him? How should a tribal chief behave? What about a family man, a mother, a father, the children? How should the children behave their parents? How about the teachers and the students? How should they behave each other? I've heard this story from Haj Sheikh. This scholar wrote a book and uh, gave the book to his scholar, to his teacher and master to see the book. The teacher gave back the book, but he said that there was a problem with the book. A, a healthy person should be healthy in all his organs and parts. He should have a healthy heart, healthy, a healthy liver, and so on and so forth. The late Fisharaki, his teacher, told to Hat Sheikh, the author of that book, Hat Sheikh used to study with Mirza Shirazi and Fisharaki at the same time. The late Fisharaki is one of the great Shia Islamic jurists. Fisharaki, his teacher, told him that there is a problem with the book. He said that you did not say anything on your own behalf, you just explained my opinions. Why didn't you criticize my, my views in your book? I have not seen any of these two characters, Hat Sheikh or Mr. Fisharaki. But there is the same story about two other people whom I'm not going to mention their names. There was a scholar and he had, an, he had a student. His student used to tell me that I, he said that I wrote a book on the 
about uh, my teacher. My teacher told me that there is a problem with the book. That scholar told me that his teacher said that there is a problem with his book because he was criticizing his teacher. Two different stories. We should learn these things. It is not feasible to acquire these characteristics. We have only one chance of living in this life. Well, actually, the youth don't have to dig graves and sleep in that. They have to just remind themselves of the final day. Satan has vowed to Almighty God. He has told Almighty God. And this is mentioned in Holy Quran that I will entice them all except for those sincere followers. God Almighty tells people that they have an, an enemy like Satan. He has promised that he will misguide all people, all servants of Almighty God, from different ways, from social desires, using uh, wealth, power, everything. They just try, the Satans, they try to misguide people. As we are speaking here, Satan is trying to misguide people. Even the Holy Prophet said that Satan is with me trying to misguide me. But the Prophet said that Satan, that the Satan with him is idle-handed. He doesn't have a power over the Prophet. If the Prophet is being followed by Satan who is trying to misguide the, pe misguide the Prophet, so we are also being Entist and entist by the Satan. One Satan is always with us, trying to deceive us, to misdirect us from the right path. They ch these Satans try always to deceive people. It is a promise made by those Satans. They have promised to deceive the servants of Almighty God. He said, the Satan said, that he would not allow most people to be guided towards Almighty God. Let's we all make a decision. Even in a non-Muslim country, the youth can be very pious people. It's only a matter of making a decision. Still, people within the house of the Holy Prophet can be misguided. She committed several sins just before the eyes of the Holy Prophet. So, you should not envy people who are 
with the Holy Prophet, Imam Ida or Imam Ali, peace be upon them. But you should also know that Satan does not leave anybody. Every person has this capacity to be a great servant of God. Abu Dhar, he was an idol worshipper. He came to the Holy Prophet and became a devout Muslim. But the Prophet's uncle was never guided. It was the Prophet's own blood. Satan and the commanding soul are never, they never stop working. Ramadan is a great opportunity. You should start making a resolution to excel in this month. So self-development and guiding others is one primary task in this Ramadan. Secondly, the next task of the believers is to defend Almighty God. The majority of people in our world do not believe in Almighty God. So who is responsible to present them with the belief in Almighty God? Are they all these people to be blamed? Certainly not. We should defend the Holy Prophet of Islam. We should defend the Holy Quran and the Holy Household of the Prophet, especially Imam al-Mahdi, may God hasten his advent. Especially at this time, that the world is filled with great campaigns of corruption and immoralities both in Muslim and non-Muslim countries. All people are responsible. All dear youth should know that they are responsible. Everybody is responsible, no matter where they live. Of course, proportionate to their capacities. They have a responsibility, but that is dependent on their powers and skills. People should speak about Islam as much as they know. They should improve themselves, they should study so that they can present Islam. People should spend money on this path. People should use their social standing, their political position. Everybody should use their potentials to serve Islam. I remember that somebody in Karbala came to my father and gave him a very small money to my father as tax money. That was his tax money. He performed his duty. But the rich people should also pay their taxes. It's their duty. Someone was asked, some rich people was asked if he's going to pay homes, the tax money. He just said that it doesn't make sense to pay homes. He kept saying that if I want to pay tax money, it would make a very huge amount of money. So why should I pay that money? 
پرفورمنس بدم باید فلان قد میلیارد بدم گفتم خب وقت چی گفت میشه داد He kept saying that it is nonsense to pay that amount of money as tax. Why doesn't the person pay the tax money? Does it make him poor? Of course not. One of those rich people told me that, he said, told me that if I do not make any more money and if I just live for another 200 years, I, can, I cannot spend all of my money, even if I live with high standards. Money is a tool by which Almighty God tests people. Knowledge, power, they all are means by which Almighty God tests people. Self-development is a duty that everyone should start performing it. I have seen many cases of people who accuse Almighty God of false qualities, even within the Muslim society. They attribute very ugly things to Almighty God, which are even impossible to say. They would not even, people, normal people would not even make these insults to normal people in their cities, but they speak these things to Almighty God. Some Jews say, that Almighty God created this world like a bicycle. But God has no control over this bicycle, and so God is always upset. These Jews believe that God's hands are tied. So God is crying every day on Saturday, and his eye drop, uh, his tears are just poured into the waters in the world. On the other hand, we see that Christians paint pictures of Almighty God like an old beautiful person, while the philosophers say that God is always laughing. Who is responsible for guiding these people to the true path? God Almighty is introduced in the Holy Quran by the Holy Prophet of Islam and the pure household, the Ahlul Bayt. We should defend this. We should defend the Holy Prophet of Islam. Many smearing campaigns have been launched against the Holy Prophet of Islam on the social media outlets. There are many satellite TVs that broadcast programs 24-7 against the Holy Prophet of Islam by Christians, Jews, or even atheists. Even we find these insults about the Holy Prophet in the books of some uh, schools of Islam. We should preach, and it is the responsibility of everyone. It is a collective duty. There is a famous prayer.
was a part of a longer prayer by Imam Salah, peace be upon him, and Allah Majlisi, and Sayyid ibn Tabus and Shaykh Tusi have, they all have recorded this prayer in their books. And this prayer, I recommend the youth to read these two prayers. Allahumma arifni nafsak. This is the beginning of the prayer. You can find this prayer. Find it and read it. The Shia youth, the Muslim youth, they all should read this prayer. One sentence in this prayer is the following. One sentence in this prayer is an invocation to Almighty God. It says, Almighty God, revived by the hands of Imam Al Mahdi, what was lost from your religion? One of the things that was lost from the religion of God is the law of free land in Islamic culture. Many of the Muslims are not aware of this law. The prayer says, O God, revive what has been lost from your religion by the hands of Imam al-Mahdi. Revive is about things that existed, but they were destroyed or they were lost, and now they have to be revived. So this prayer is speaking about the Islamic principles that have been lost during time. O oh God, revive what was lost from your religion, what was lost from your religion by the hands of Imam al-Mahdi. These principles were practiced during the Holy Prophet of Islam, during the time of the Holy Prophet of Islam and Imam al-Ali. The dear youth should be careful about each word of these prayers. They carry strong meanings. If you comprehend one hadith perfectly, it would be better for you than reading 100 hadith. Is it Salah that has been lost from the religion of God? No, people are still performing Salah. People used to pray, perform Salah during the time of the Abbasid and Umayyad regimes. This is the same about this is the same about fasting and Hajj. People used to fast and they continuing the same thing even up till now. People used to go on Hajj and they are still going to Hajj every year. Millions of people go to Hajj every year. Certainly Hajj, fasting and prayers have not been lost from the religion of God. So what was lost from the religion of God? And what is that Imam Mahdi is going to revive? 
دیگران هم میتونن اهل خبره باشه روایت صحیحه داره در همین به حال دم دست هست There is a reliable hadith in the book Bihar al-Anwar. It says that Imam Mahdi will continue to behave exactly like his ancestor, his grand, uh, the Holy Prophet, and his father, Imam Ali. حکومت علی ابن ابی طالب صلوات الله علیه که مثل حکومت پیغمبر خدا صلی الله علیه و آله بوده چون خود امیر المومنین امام علی is the soul of the holy prophet and they both had the same time the same methods as rulers It is mainly about Islamic economy, Islamic politics, Islamic sociology, and so on and so forth. The Holy Prophet passed away while he was the leader of an Islamic government, and he was still in debt. He didn't take those debts for himself. Imam Ali was the leader of the largest Islamic government. And when he was martyred, he was in debt. He gave away everything in the public treasury. And then he prayed in the public treasury after he was after he had given everything away to the people. And he didn't keep anything for himself. This is the Islamic method. This is the method that is going to be revived by Imam al-Mahdi. This is how an Islamic leader should behave. An Islamic leader should behave like Imam Ali, peace be upon him. Once a scholar was told if he would allow people to color the wall of his house, he just refused because he said that God Almighty has taken a vow from the scholars to live exactly like the poor people. He said that whenever you could paint the wall of all houses, then you can at the end come here and paint the wall of my house. People came to Imam Ali, peace be upon him, and said, He was acquainted with those people who ruled after the Holy Prophet and before Imam Ali. He visited Imam Ali and saw that Imam Ali didn't ha doesn't have anything in his house. It is so unfortunate to read, to read these stories. In Medina, when the Holy Prophet was the leader of the government, His Holiness used to live in a very small room, three meters by three meters. This was the size of the room of the Islamic leader. And this room was half covered by half covered by a covering. Lady Fatima Zahra also had the same way of life. Her husband was Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, by whose sword Islam was upheld. Of course, Imam Ali used his sword in defensive matters. He was not a conqueror. The Holy Prophet and Imam Ali were never conquerors. 
The conquerors were other people, those people who falsely claimed to be the successors of the Holy Prophet of Islam. In the marriage ceremony, the marriage ceremony of Imam Ali and Lady Fatima Zahra, the skin of an animal was covered, uh, covered the floor of the house of Imam Ali and Lady Fatima. They used it both as their as their covering on the floor and as their blanket. The young girls should look up to Lady Fatima Zahra and don't be so much luxurious. The boys should also look up to Imam Ali and don't be so much after a luxurious lifestyle. Everybody is responsible to act and to present these realities to the world. The late Kashif al Ghatta, the great scholar, I had met him in Karbala. I'm going to narrate you two stories from this great scholar. There has been a book published lately from this scholar. The book's name is Oqood Hayati. This book records the lifestyle and the biography of this great scholar in decades, in, ten, in every ten years. This scholar used to live in the Ottoman, uh, at the time of the Ottoman Empire. This scholar wrote a book about Imam, the Imamate. This book was published by this scholar, the judge of Baghdad, who represented the Ottoman Empire. He sent this book to the Turkish, to Turkey, the capital of the Ottoman Empire. In those times, the entire Muslim world was ruled by the Ottoman Empire, but the Iran was not ruled by the Ottoman Empire at the time. It was ruled by the it was ruled by Iranian shahs. The judge of Baghdad sent this book, the book about Imamate, to the great judge of the Ottoman Empire in Turkey. And he just said that Kashif al this scholar, should not be put in prison. But he asked the great judge of Turkey to summon this scholar, Kashif al from Najaf. And he asked the great judge of Turkey to find Kashif al for writing such a book. Kashif al was summoned to Baghdad, to Turkey, and he was condemned. The great judge fined him from 10 to 20 lira, the Turkish currency of the time. It was a big money, it was a large amount of money. 
این یه قصه یه قصه دیگه مال خود ایشون حالا من نمیدونم ایشون نوشتن یا نه دیگه من نخوندم همه یعنی کتاب اما خود من یادم This is one of those stories and now here's another story بود که من یادم یه قدری آزادی بود After the Ottoman Empire, there was some relative freedom in Iraq. Although Iraq was an Islamic country, but the laws of the country were not Islamic. There was a person named Sayyid Qasim Kefai. He published a book about Lady Fatima Zahra. In this book, he offered some documented and verified information about those people who murdered Lady Fatima. Some people started rallies in Baghdad. They, prost they protested the publication of this book. I myself remember this story. Sayyid Qasim Kefai was imprisoned so that protests stop. The late Kash Falgata, who was a few years back fined by the Ottoman Empire, he was informed of this incident. He sent a telegraph to Nuri Said. At that time, Nuri Said was one of the most powerful political leader in the entire Middle East. The late Kash Falgata sent a telegraph to Nuri Said. This telegraph had two words. And it was an order to release Said Qasim Kafai or and it didn't continue. And by that threat, Said Qasim Kafai was released. Today, the entire world, or at least most of the world, are free. Even in Islamic countries, there are relative freedoms. We should use these freedoms to defend the Almighty God, to defend the Holy Quran. I was shown a picture from the social media. It was a picture from the Holy Prophet of Islam. It was so disrespectful. Are all those people enemies of the Holy Prophet? No, they are ignorant. But still, in the, in the country where these pictures are drawn, there are still people who can present the reality about the Holy Prophet of Islam among people. Many insults have been cast at Imam Ali, even in Islamic countries. There are insults spreading about Imam Mahdi, even at our time. The message should be clearly delivered to people. It's an obligatory act. If we have to improve our knowledge about the Ahlul Bayt, we must do it. Sheikh Muhammad Hassan Ali Yassin He used to live 200 years ago. 
توی مجلسی بوده که اون وقت همون ایام حکومت عثمانی بود شیخ آل محمد علی حسین یوسف لیف 200 ایرز اگو جوین دی آرمن امپایر مجلسی اشنام بوده یکی از اونا از حالا <coughs> علا کل مسئله دویوم ماه مبارک رمضان انسان تصمیم بگیره We must make a firm resolution in this holy month of Ramadan to defend to defend Almighty God. It is an obligatory duty. It is a collective duty. And as long as duty is not fulfilled, we have to join forces to defend the Almighty God, the Holy Prophet, the Holy Household, and the Holy Quran. Today there are people being guided from atheism and from other sects of Islam to the genuine Islam. A few nights ago, some Western person came here at this place. He was coming with three women. They had just converted to Islam. He wasn't guided years ago because he wasn't informed of Islam. And when he was informed about Islam, he was guided. That's the reality. Why during the time of the Holy Prophet, people converted to Islam in groups, in large groups? Because the Holy Prophet had this power to attract people and we as Muslims have this duty to present Islam to the world so that be they become attracted to Islam. And the best opportunity for this job is the holy month of Ramadan. I pray to Almighty God to help us, everyone, even the youth, to perform these duties during the month of Ramadan. May God bless Muhammad and his pure household.